So, returning to making houses. So here, at the beginning of the Neolithic, the beginnings of agriculture and settlements being normal permanent settlements, we have architecture that looks a lot like um, things that aren't permanent, a lot like some of those tents and other structures we were looking at previously. Um, the wicker roof covered with straw, something like that, and for walls just a circle of rocks, a few mud bricks, and Bob's your uncle. Very simple mud bricks of that loaf of bread type. So eventually they started making square buildings, um, lots of plaster, so you can see plaster floors on the outside, plaster floors on the inside, plaster on all the walls inside and outside, a lot of the features and on the roof. And so plaster is a big thing, lime plaster, as is like burying people under the floor and doing funny things with them afterwards. Here at Chattel Hoyuk, we have a similar sort of thing going on. Um, a lot of defense being considered. There's not like a lot of doors on the outside. People would climb on the roof with a ladder that you could uh, pull back up again and go into the house through the ceiling. This uh, reconstruction of a Chattel Hoyuk house has things going on on the roof, and there's always things going on on the roof in these flat houses in the Middle East. Um, here they've got little shelters on top as well. You get an idea of things happening on upper stories by the things that have fallen into the lower stories that don't seem to be related to what's going on there when you dig it up uh, as an archaeologist. And here, again in the Levant, we have a two-story building, probably worked out in exactly the same way. So lots of mud brick, lots of plaster, and some wood to keep it all, keep the roof up. This is a Calcolithic village. Um, it looks pretty much like a Middle Eastern village would look to this day. Um, I remember the first time I went to the Middle East, it was actually to Saudi Arabia in 1977. And I had gone driving up to a village that looked exactly like this. The only difference would be the massive uh, satellite dishes on every house where they were getting very nice uh, television reception. Um, but this sort of architecture is so stable as a technology. Mud bricks are very warm when it's cold outside and very cool when it's hot outside. They're easy to make, they're economical, and as long as you look after them, they will last quite a long time. So one thing you don't obviously see here is some spiritual center. It's probable that people living in a village like this would have been continuing the same spiritual practices they had for millennia before. Uh, Worshipping on high places, uh, springs, um, other things like that, uh, trees. Caves are very, a very big spiritual centery place around the world. And the, the study of places that become spiritual centers is a big thing in archaeology nowadays. And as someone that worked at a spiritual center, a monastery, which is basically centered around caves, it's something I'm quite interested in. And so it might be that they would go up to a hill to worship their deities or down to a spring. This, however, is a big temple. Uh, this is uh, unusual. It's probably the earliest temple, if temple is, is what we can call it. It's certainly a, a very important spiritual center, but uh, it's also a high place. Um, this area down here, this ceremonial center presumably, is associated with a, a high place in the region. And in fact, two recent times, in fact possibly to this day, this mulberry tree in the highest point of Gobekli Tepe, um, it's still people go here and 
pray for wishes. They call it the wishing tree. So it remained to be a spiritual center to this day. In Iraq, they didn't have a lot of high places. Iraq's all pretty much the same level. So in order to find something that was high, they had to build it. And so they started building these big platforms to put their spiritual spaces on top of them. Uh, here you can see it's also got some defensive architecture on. I think this is for a bit more than keeping the goats out. Don't you? Uh, the temple itself is white because it's entirely conjectural. Um, but one thing it has that is definitive of buildings of this nature later on is a pilaster, a half column, a square half column uh, at the side of the building. And this is necessary for any really big building made of, well, of anything really, but mud brick, of course, is, would not be as uh, robust a building material as fired brick, which had been kept together by lime mortar or stone. And so pilasters are essential for a large mud brick building like a temple or a palace, or possibly a bit of both in some cases. Here at ancient Eridu, and I particularly like this because of the boat, you can see that sort of thing. We have uh, the early temple there shows you these pilasters actually on the building because this is sort of preserved. You go in like this and there's the deity. The white temple at Uruk, Uruk of course you know quite well now, if you didn't before, um, has the uh, Hanu Ziggurat. The plan looks like this. It looked like this during excavation. As you can see, it's a lot of mud and it's sort of squishy. And later on, years after the excavation, it looked like this. You can see, here's those stairs going up to the Ziggurat. So it's just like a big pile of mud that people have piled up to create their own high place. And this is what it actually would have looked like. You can see the pilasters on the building. The city walls of Uruk were, of course, built by Gilgamesh, according to his epic. Um, according to his, him as a source, or his, his uh, narrative poem, epic poem, uh, the walls were actually made of fired brick. But, you know, how far can you believe politicians? Uh, Habuba Kabira is an Uruk period site in northern Syria which does have walls and you can see they're quite nice. They have gates and things like that. Here we have another one of these high places, a, a man-made or human-made high place at Ur, the ziggurat of Ur built by ur -Namu. And what's particularly interesting about this is the stele which probably commemorates its construction. Here you have Urunamu himself, you see, and here he is talking to one deity, and here he's talking to another deity. He's preserved in another piece here. So he's talking to his deity, and his deity is giving him these very important architectural devices. Here is a coil of rope used for measuring things out, and here is a rod used for measuring things out. So this is very essential uh, architectural stuff. And down here you can see his deity with his, his horned crown is leading ur to where he needs to build the temple. So back to domestic architecture. Um, the Ur house, or the Ur bait as it's sometimes called, uh, a bait is a house in Arabic, um, is pretty much what a house has looked like in the Middle East to recent times and in fact across the Mediterranean with this central open area, courtyard, and rooms around it. In this case, two stories of rooms around it. So this became the main type of house, and you'll see this being constructed in the Middle East until recent times, as I say, until people just said, oh, let's build a house any old way out of concrete. This, of course, allows light in and air in, and also enables people to move around freely without being seen. And you go in through here. 
And of course, of all these man-made high places, the most famous was the Tower of Babel, the great ziggurat at Babylon, which led to a very bad press uh, in the Bible. So inside these temples, worshipping went on. Um, this is inside a temple. I don't know who these guys are, but this this is an altar. And this is an altar. And you might say, how do we know this is an altar, not just like a dog grooming platform? Um, well, this is a clue. If we didn't have any other sources, this would do it. Because this is like one of those IKEA tables with the instructions attached to it. Because here you can see on this thing that looks like this, you put up a symbol of your deity and you worship it. It's very useful. If only more things in the archaeological record told you what things were for, it would be make our life a lot simpler. Here's another useful thing, the Narmer palette, named after this chap, Narmer. I believe uh, the first chap to uh, depicted with the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, although they're not in one crown at this stage, in the classic Pharaoh smiting uh, enemies pose. But what's important and relevant at the moment is that we know it's King Narmer because his name, which means uh, catfish, uh, is obviously in a building. And you can see by the nature of the building that it must be a palace or a temple, and so he must be a king. This is the other side, and you can see all sorts of fun things happening here. You can see people being beheaded. And here again, you can see the fish in the palace or the temple showing it's the king. And here, presumably personifying Narwa, is this bull who's knocking down what looks like a city wall, a sort of round city wall with what looks like tents inside. So tombs in Egypt, um, these mastaba tombs, mastaba is Arabic for a step, and so they're like step tombs, just like step on top of them, um, are actually based on houses. And so they'll have all the architectural fe features of a house from the outside, or the, quite a big house, like a palace, of course, um, but they're solid, solid mud brick. Now, as you can see, the geology of the Middle East isn't the same everywhere. And so you'll find that uh, the available resources for stone in Iran is different from Turkey, and particularly from Syria and Egypt. And you can see in Syria and Egypt, there's these big flat areas, large areas of the country are covered with the same kind of stone, limestone, sandstones, but it's possible to rely on stone and rely on working stone and going from place to place and building with the same stone. Uh, in Turkey and Iran, you can see it doesn't work so well. And so, although there is some very impressive stone architecture in both of these countries, um, the stone in where you want to build may be rubbish. And so you should develop other ways of creating architecture. And of course, in Iraq, they just have mud. So rubble architecture is very big in places like uh, Iran, where you can rely on rocks at least being sort of rock-like. And this is a, a Sasanian uh, fortress and palace. And you can see it's made just of cobbles and rocks covered with plaster. So plaster is very good for covering up what's going on underneath. And here, of course, bricks. Bricks are also very popular in Iran because you can't rely on the stone so much. Here in Syria, however, you can see they developed very good stone architecture. And you can see stone architecture of, of this quality all over greater Syria, where they have available stone, they have available skill based on the widespread same stone and can build things. 
and of course in Egypt it's the same. This is the earliest stone architecture. We're back at Saqqara, the uh, Jeriket or Djoser complex. And here we have some of the best stonework that's ever been done right at the beginning of stonework. Um, this is a door. It's been carved to look like a door, though it actually doesn't function as a door. And these are supposedly wooden beams in a roof, which are made of solid rock. So it's made to last forever for uh, a fair on his afterlife. So this pyramid um, is an evolution from what started off as just being a mastaba, and then a slightly bigger mastaba and a slightly larger mastaba. And then we thought, oh, let's just like pile more on top in this nature. And then, oh, let's make it even bigger. And so they made the first pyramid just by getting out of control. So, but it's very successful. As you might have noticed from the photographs, it's still there now. This chap had less success, as you can probably tell by the disappointed look on his face. His first disaster was at Maidum, where he tried to uh, build a pyramid like uh, the one at Saqqara, and it fell down. And you just had this pile of stone standing up there, so he tried again. And this is probably also a total disaster. It's hard to be entirely sure. What it looks like is they started building a pyramid in the, the later normal way of just putting one stone on top of another and doing it at this angle, which at this point they realized was too steep. So they just reduced the angle. Or maybe Stefaru wanted it to look like this, but it's probably a mistake judging by the look on his face, which looks very disappointed. And then the third time was the Red Pyramid at Dashur, which was perfect. And I think he was a bit happy now, because if you look carefully, it looks like he's got a little smile there. So this led to, of course, the Great Pyramids at Giza. Um, although the evidence would suggest something different is happening here. And if you look at the disposition and the relationship between these things, they clearly show that there's a, this relationship with pyramids which have been identified on Mars. And they have exactly the same geometry. So although um, there seems to be a line of evidence of the development of pyramids, it seems that these ones were actually built by Martians. Um, so back to architecture. The arch is quite quite important. Uh, this is a corbelled arch here in the royal term, tombs at Ur. You can see how you make a corbelled arch is you just keep putting the bricks closer and closer until they meet in the middle. This is corbelling. So corbelling was very popular in, in uh, earlier times, um, but it, you can't make a very big archway. You know, that the size as big as it gets, or, or bigger, but not a lot bigger. This is supposedly the first true arch that we have in the archaeological record. Um, it looks moderately convincing, but since all of this is made up, uh, it's hard to be certain. But, you know, it'll do for now. So in true arches, as opposed to corbelled arches, you need a keystone. This is how it's different. So instead of the rocks just getting closer and closer and closer, you have this dynamic arch with these these uh, stones, these voussoirs, joining together with the keystone in the middle. And it throws the energy out this way. And so you have to have these very powerful abutments on each side. And so this makes the true arch. This was very popular with the Romans, of course, who made it into a dome and basically built arches all over the Mediterranean world. Um, very, very popular with the Romans and really showed people that the Romans were here. It's sort of like a, uh, a symbol, shall we say, to show who was running things. Rather like the pottery, which also was rather like a uh, trademark. So Roman houses were very different 
from the Middle Eastern houses before. This is known as the triclinium layout based on the triclinium, which is three benches where you recline. So one, two, three, climbing triclinium. And so the owner of the house lives here or sits here. He's like very important. He has his important friends here and maybe somebody sitting at the bottom. This is actually from a house in the Galilee. And so it's a Roman house that these are Judeans who are living in it. Uh, but they're very wealthy, Roman-oriented Judeans. And the, the way the triclinium house works is you have this, and then you have the courtyard here, where it's open all the way through to the street. And the purpose of this in the Roman philosophy is to show everybody their place in the world. So you can be here and see how wealthy this person is right here. If you want to see that person, you might be let in this far. If you're a bit more important, you might come this far and, and he'll go and talk to you then or send somebody or something. But to get this far, you have to be very important. So it makes the hierarchy of society very, very, very visible, which is exactly the sort of thing that really annoyed Middle Eastern people. So back to Middle Eastern ideas of things. This is the uh, Taki Khazra or Ivan i Khazra. Uh, Taki is a palace. Ivan is what this thing is. Uh, this is a very big arch, um, but that's, that's all it was meant to be. Uh, it was a big arch which was creating a nice shadow. And Ivan is just basically somewhere to hang out in the shade, but outside. Um, this is, I'm starting to reconstruct this bit here. And so this is basically what it meant to be looked like. And you can imagine the archway would have carried on being up here. This wall would have gone up to the, to the top. And so it would just be this big shadowed area. And so this is that one, this Ivan. <clears throat> and so you see it's facing east, so it will warm up when the sun rises, but then when the sun comes around here, it will be cool. And so this would be a perfect place to hang out. And here these other buildings had Ivans pointing in different directions. And so this became a very important aspect of Middle Eastern palaces from this point onwards. So that's it for this bit of architecture. In the next lecture we shall have more.